Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. You know, most of us work at home in our pajamas, um, in attics or in basements or in, in you know, little whatever tents we can find. And, and one never dreams of this day. Uh, one only hopes that someday a reader will come up to you and connect and say, I liked your story. And so when you're granted and graced with a room full of people who come to honor your work, um, it's sort of hard to imagine that there's anything better in life. Uh, so thank you very, very much. I'm going to read to you a brief segment of my story tonight. Um, it's set here in New York City uh, a couple years ago uh, during the American Revolution when Washington had fled because the British had shown up with twice as many soldiers and good, good guns. Uh, and one in five people on the streets of New York was a slave. My character here is Isabel. She's owned by loyalists. She has seen her five-year-old sister sold away from her. She tried to run away, was caught in the attempt and branded, and was then um, submerged in six months of depression and sorrow, as New York City was submerged in sorrow with the occupation of the British Army. Uh, and the fire that devastated a quarter of the buildings in the city and thousands of lives. And this scene I'm going to read to you briefly uh, is when she has been imprisoned in the basement of this house, the people who own her, for she to be sold the next day. And she has just found out that her sister was not sold to the West Indies, but her sister was sold close by, well, sort of close by. And here we go. And then came the sound of a distant roar, like a lion just sprung from a trap. I froze, waiting. No one was home except for Lady Seymour, and she was not capable of making noise. The roar came again. I cocked my head and listened. It did not come from the street, nor the house above. It was not cannon fire. T'was inside me, a thought, thunderous loud. Ruth was alive. Alive in Charleston, in South Carolina, not on a ship, not on an island. Alive in a town I can walk to. My toes wiggled in my sturdy black shoes and my legs itched. She's locked in a potato bin. I lay flat as I could on the bumpy mound of potatoes and kicked once at the boards of the bin. My heavy shoes made a terrible loud noise on the wood. I stopped, counted to 100. There came no sound from overhead, no commotion out in the street. I kicked again at the same spot. The potatoes under me shifted and the mug of water overturned. I kicked a third time. The boards did not move at all. I cursed the carpenter who had built this tomb. There has to be a way out. I kicked, stomped, slammed. I raged and screamed and fought. Nothing happened. I stopped. Wipe the sweat from my face and close my eyes. Think, think, remember. When Ruth and I slept down here, the far corner of the cellar went muddy in a heavy rain. Maybe the damp had eaten at the boards. I moved over to that corner of the bin and scooped the potatoes out of the way, heaping them behind me. I sat back and put my feet on each board in turn and pushed. The third board I tried gave way a little. So did the next two. I moved the potato heap so I could best lean against it and push with my legs. I kicked. There was a quiet crack. I kicked again and leaned forward to feel the boards. The one had a piece chipped off where the wood was rotted through. The other had a long split in it. I leaned back and took a deep breath and then kicked and kicked with all my strength until the wood broke and flew into the dark. I took the stairs two at a time and paused before I entered the kitchen. The house was still silent. I hurried down the hall, past the grandfather clock, and up the stairs to the drawing room. I needed a map and had a mind to steal a pass if I could. I threw some wood on the fire, lit a candle from the flames, and carried it to the long dining table covered with maps and countless papers. I lit the rest of the candles on the table as if preparing for a feast, then searched through the papers, throwing those that were useless to me to the floor. Finally, I found a small map that showed the colonies from Massachusetts down to Georgia. The distance from Rhode Island to New York was the same as the tip of my little finger to the first knuckle under it. From New York to Charleston, 
stretched all the way down my fingers to my palm. The crackling firewood startled me. I glanced up. There was a movement over the hearth, and for an instant my heart caught in my throat a ghost. The firelight brightened. No, not a ghost. I had caught a sight of myself in the large mirror that hung over the mantel. I could scarce recognize me. My hands fumbled for a candle. I moved to the mirror, guarding the flame, and lit the oil lamps that were set into the wall. The mirror caught the light and reflected it back at me. I leaned in. In truth, it seemed I was looking at a stranger who had lived beyond the glass. My face was thinner than I remembered and longer from brow to chin. My nose and mouth recollected mamas, but the set of the eyes, those came from Papa. As I stared, their two faces came forth and drifted back until I could see only me. I turned my head to the side a bit and studied the brand on my face for the first time. Studied it hard. The capital I that proclaimed my insolent manners and crimes. I leaned closer to the mirror. The letter was a pink ribbon embroidered on my skin. I touched it smooth and warm, flesh made into silk. The scars on Papa's face had been three lines across his cheek, carved with a sharp blade. He was proud of his marks. In the country of his ancestors, they made him into a man. I traced the eye with my fingertip. This is my country mark. I did not ask for it, but I would carry it as Papa carried his. It made me his daughter. It made me strong. I took a step back, seeing near my whole self in the mirror. I pushed back my shoulders and raised my chin, my back straight as an arrow. This mark stands for Isabel. Thank you.